Hey folks, welcome back to The Stang Show. I'm Luke Stanger, your host, and I just finished cutting my new episode. I think it's one you're really going to like. It's with Tom Christofiak. He just finished writing a book called Tempted to Believe. It's a really cool book, and we get into all kinds of topics, including... Man, we go back and forth about the Matrix, we talk about aliens, we get into the TM movement, uh, all these things that, you know, how we structure beliefs in society and individually, we talk about Santa. It's a wild ride, I'm not gonna lie, and it's also super fun, so stick around, I think you're gonna enjoy it. Ground control to Major Tom. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Luke. I I feel lucky today. Um, of course, I, I know you and I grew up with you, and we spent many many a Thanksgiving at your house. That's right. And I've got um, the photos to prove it. <laughs> yeah, you do. Um, I admittedly I only got about a, a third of the way through your brick, so I hope to learn a lot today. But um. I'm I'm absolutely loving it. I was really excited because I felt like I think you and I probably have a lot in common, and um, I'm I'm just curious to pick your brain about hmm. your philosophy and and why. So why now with the book? Why now? Well, I could tell a story if you want me to take a few minutes. I'd love to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Why this book? Why now? Whatever. Uh, how did it happen? Uh, you know, I was on an academic career a long time ago. You know, I got a degree from Harvard and Cambridge University, and, and I was on an academic track that I'd probably be a professor. Then I got introduced to TM somewhere in the middle of all that, and I liked it, and I was very intrigued and interested about it. And I decided to abandon my academic career and pursue something that I thought might be, would be, more significant and practically helpful to large numbers of people. So it was that kind of a inspiration because I liked it and uh, learned more about it. And then I decided, okay, that means I have to become a teacher, a meditation teacher. So I was trained with Maharishi Maharishi became a teacher. And then I taught in England and I taught in the U.S. for a while. And then uh, Diana, my wife and I, uh, well, what happened was, as you know, Luke, there was a huge gathering of, of what we could call advanced meditators in this little town of Fairfield, Iowa. You know, the population was about 9,000 at that time, and about seven or 8,000 people came to town from all over the U.S. and, and uh, parts of the world. It was a wild time, and the reason they came together was to try to prove or test whether a large group of advanced meditators doing their thing together, all together, could literally move the world, change change the destiny of the world, so to speak. Did you believe that at the time? Um, I was intrigued by it. So that is, that's part of the thing. Um, I've been a skeptic. I've had skeptic tendencies my whole life. But when I got interested in TM and all the excitement about it, and all the groups I was involved with in Europe and everywhere, um, there's a certain temptation. That's why I called my book Tempted to Believe. You, there's a certain temptation that came through, you know, to, wow, maybe, maybe this stuff might be true. It was never like I absolutely know it's true, but there was enough of a, of a temptation there to make me say, I'm going to go for go for this to, to whatever extent. So, yeah, I mean, I was, I was absolutely ready to entertain the possibility and hope that, uh, that we might really knock, knock something open with that huge uh, gathering. Um, I wouldn't call it a belief quite. <laughs> I wouldn't say it was an absolute, uh, anything like a certainty. I don't know what probability I would give it, but anyway, so that <laughs> happened. And then we we decided to stay here, so we've been here ever since. That that was in 1983, and uh, again, as you know, Luke, uh, most of the people back then, not so much today, but most of them back then, and many of them today, did embrace a whole bunch of beliefs that were quite certain in their minds. 
And these included some really extraordinary, or I might even use the word outlandish things, uh, including the fact that humans could levitate, that uh, it was absolutely critical for your health and well-being that you lived in a house with certain proportions and directions, otherwise you were going to be in trouble, that something called Vedic astrology called um, Jyotish, just a form of astrology, could totally predict the future and, and prevent all sorts of difficulties, on and on and on, uh, that, that, that we we're on a path to what was called enlightenment, and that once you achieve that state, which you should after a relatively small number of years, it was impossible to make a mistake. So all these things are really extraordinary or outlandish. And at that time, virtually everybody believed that to a, to a pretty good degree. And my skeptical nature started coming <laughs> out more and more because I'm always interested in evidence and the proof and and is this really true or is this just something we want to be true or uh, we've been told or whatever? And so as the skepticism grew, and I was kind of out of sync with a lot of people, it wasn't a source of conflict, but it was a source of difference mm. that I was surrounded by, by people who believe things that I didn't believe. And eventually I got to the point, I'd say, I'm just going to make up a round number, 1990, whatever, something like that where you know you asked you, you'd be interested in exploring what things i do believe well on the level of belief that i'm talking about now which is here's a proposition or a claim about the way the world works that is astrology predicts the future or you have to live in a house like this otherwise you're not going to have good health and prosperity or you know the other th that a human being can fly or that a group of people can in in a town like fairfield iowa can change the entire world the collective consciousness of the world, these kinds of things, um, I didn't believe any of them in terms of a belief in that claim, a factual claim about the world. Mm. So I would say around that time and continuing to the present day, I have zero beliefs in anything that I would call, I, in my book, I, I changed the term to call it off grid. Right. An off grid belief, which means it doesn't participate in any kind of a scientific, rigorous, open process of trying to determine what is what can be shown to be true versus what we want to believe for other reasons. And so at that point, so those those kind of beliefs, um, I, again, as I said, I, I think I have zero of them. And at this point, a number, quite a number of my friends and associates have loosened up on their beliefs quite a bit over the years. <laughs> um, so it's not like I feel alone. But anyway, around that time, that was the seed for this book because I wanted, I wasn't like, hey, what's wrong with these people? They're all crazy. You know, what are they doing? It wasn't like that at all. It was more, what's going on here? Why do I have this? strong skeptical nature, which precludes these kinds of off-grid or outlandish beliefs. And the other people around me, which include very intelligent, accomplished people in many cases, um, believe, find it very easy and attractive to believe all kinds of things. I mean, what is the deal here? Why am I missing something? So that was the quest, not to prove anybody wrong or to prove that I'm right in my viewpoint, but to say, why? what is the nature of this difference? Just to explore why I am the way I, or not, I'm not talking psychologically, but how did I get here? But I mean, what is the, what is the deal that, that, that my mental makeup mm. goes this way? and prevents all these beliefs from landing and taking hold. And that's not the case for so many other people. And it's obviously not just Fairfield. It's just that was the seed for me because I was surrounded by it. Yeah, it's super relatable to me. I, I find myself usually in the skept skepticism camp. And it's so easy to associate that with being a killjoy. <laughs> like right. everyone's just like, what the hell, man? Just go along with it. And um <clears throat> you know, I, I 
you know, like probably my favorite pastime is to just like pick apart commercials. And I'm, I'm just really annoying to be in the room with if we're watching our favorite TV show on Hulu uh, or whatever it is. Cause I'm just like, Oh my God. And look at that writing. It's just absolutely absurd. I, I'm not going along with this. Um, right. But you, you know, your story as you just told it kind of begs the question, you're, you're still a practitioner of, of TM, a transcendental meditation for the listeners who, who don't know what that is. But so what, What's the draw to you now? Um, well, or has been you know, the draw to me in the beginning, in the very beginning to uh, meditation to TM was the possibility that it would have real effects that you could actually experience and, uh, and, and gain benefit from. And it wasn't so much in the beginning, it wasn't like some, some idea of enlightenment or some special powers or abilities or anything like that, that drew me originally. In fact, you know, TM in the early days distinguished itself, particularly in the early days, distinguished itself from other spiritual or meditative things at the time by having an interest in, a, in, an, uh, in scientific research of one extent or another. And back way back then, when I first learned, there were only a few studies, you know, but there was one in Scientific American by Keith Wallace that, that gained a lot of, a lot of repute. And so that was very impressive to me. It wasn't just people talking about some amazing esoteric thing. It was, here's this process that does sound somewhat esoteric, but look at this. There's some evidence that we're gathering. We're interested in evidence and we're gathering. And so I said, great, this is the one I'm going to try because there were others around at the time. And then I found it did have benefits. You know, um, I'm talking really pragmatic benefits. I like the settling down, the 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 expansion, the release. Um, I think these are, re for me, these are healthy. These are restorative, uh, very useful technique. And so granted, when I got more and more involved in those early days and became a teacher and went on all these you know, advanced programs and things, you know, surrounded by people who are completely devoted. Uh, as I said, there's this temptation to sort of start to go in for some of these more uh, ex extraordinary claims. And, um, but as those, you know, faded away from me, I'm still left with the same thing I had in the beginning, which is I like doing this. I think it's, it seems obvious that it's good for me just subjectively. I wouldn't be at all, I've never been studied, but I wouldn't be surprised if you could prove that it's doing something good for my mm. body yeah. and mind. So that's it really for me and not just a personal thing, but I don't teach TM uh, anymore, but um, not that I wouldn't, but I, but I'm not. Um, I think it's not just me. I, th I have no reason to doubt that it would be similarly useful for almost everybody just because it's so simple and straightforward and, and its effects are, are so normal, but, uh, but beneficial. So that's why I'm still doing it. Um, but it's absolutely abs absent of any of the extraordinary or far, far reaching claims about it. Yeah. I mean, do you think it, it needed the sort of mythical, uh, you know, the, the mystical elements to, to package and, and sell it and make it as popular as it, as it was? I mean, it's like, hey, look at the Beatles. They're an authority. You know, all these various things. If you were to just say, yeah, it just gives you deep rest. Um, there is no enlightenment. There is no levitation. I mean, then then where would we be, you know? Well, that's a really good question. And I think it, it has a lot of different uh, things we could talk about. Um, one is that pro still today, as you know, there's still, I don't know, thousands of people learning TM uh, these days. Um, because there's been various pushes with David Lynch and other organizations um, bringing it to different groups of people. Anyway, I, I, I think that virtually all of those people who are learning have no, no interest or even exposure to these more extraordinary claims about enlightenment or, or uh, special breakthroughs or abilities. They're looking, they're looking for the practical pragmatic fruits. So these days, that's the focus to a large extent. Now, but the other side of that, of that question is in the early days, 
the people who flock to become TM teachers, which is the only reason it expanded around the world, is that you had thousands of people who had given up their normal path and have taken on this path of being a TM teacher. Um, those people, those mostly college age students back then in the, in the early 70s, uh, were attracted to these far more grand possibilities and claims and probably beliefs. And that uh, inspired them, as I said, to give up their normal path for at least for a while, to go gung-ho into this and teaching all over the country and all over the world, uh, you know, giving up any desire for money or making a, having a job or anything and just doing that for years. Um, and that, so those, those founding groups that made TM shoot to the top of the of the heap in terms of these kind of activities back in the mid seventies. Um, it, that was because it had these, these grand claims because the people who were teaching were so inspired by that. Yeah. And then similarly founding this, this community in Fairfield, Iowa, the th there's still th probably a few thousand people here one way or another related to this. Um, the people who like me, who gave up, you know, a job. My wife and I gave up our jobs in Wisconsin. We just moved here with no particular prospects, as did thousands of other people. Um, and they would, they wouldn't have done that just because it was a source of deep rest and 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 benefit <laughs> for the physiology. They wouldn't upend your life and start a brand new life in a new community. Um, so yeah, it was it was critical. Now another question is whether that was kind of marketing or whether it was legitimate a legitimately offered by the founder marishi um you know sure he's a good marketer there's no question so when the beatles <laughs> came on great deal was made of that not much not so much by him but by the press and everything and we were i'm sure marishi was happy to to ride that wave um and you know touting the scientific research that was a way to sort of make it interesting to Westerners. He was happy to do that. But as far as the extraordinary stuff, the claims about levitation or, or uh, enlightenment or all these other uh, astrology, all these things, my sense is he just totally believed that stuff. And so he wasn't, so to speak, trying to push his thing by, by, by all that. He actually seems to me to have believed that and then his followers believed it as well. Right. Uh, w one thing that I got to in the book, <clears throat> you're talking about the matrix. Uh, and I, I wanted to give you a little pushback on this. I think you, you kind of asserted that most people would opt for the, like the true reality, which I see very little evidence of that. Uh, <laughs> like I think, you know, people are glued to their phones. I mean, there might be some argument to be made that we are in a simulation like the matrix and that these are just incredibly tempting things, the temptation of the senses and, and you know, all of this could just be a hologram. You know, I, I am not even remotely convinced that the majority of people would say, no, I, I would rather eat the gruel and, and you know, be on the, <laughs> on the little submarine that, you know, is fighting all the uh, uh, robots. But um, maybe you could elaborate on that some more. For... That's, that's great. That's great. <laughs> um, I have absolutely no evidence for the claim that most people <laughs> would, would not choose to, to plug in to a really good Matrix type experience. Yeah. Like Cy Cypher did in, uh, <laughs> in the movie. Um, choosing to do it, knowing that it was totally <laughs> imaginary and that he'd be there for the rest of his life, you know. Um, I don't have any evidence that's true. And I'm not saying I even, be I'm not believing it. I'm not saying this is a fact about, the about life. My sense is that even though, pe and, I, and I, I think I mentioned somewhere that we all will escape reality so to speak, in lots of ways. I mean, going to the movies, what else is that? Unless you're like you, unless you're a filmmaker and you're doing it as, you know, <laughs> you're partly just learning and doing a critique and keeping the illusion at bay in a certain way at times, I'm sure when you watch films. 
but most people that's not what they're doing you you know you, you just give me a break people say give me a break you know let's uh you take a vacation you go you, you just do something maybe you take some drugs you you uh you do all kinds of immersive things uh partly to enter a different reality but so we all do that um we don't have any compunction about doing that <laughs> but at least at this point most of us by far most of us are still rooted in the real world a large part of the re most of the rest of the time um and yeah the question is if you really were given the choice like tomorrow or today okay we've got this stuff totally worked out you can plug in and there's this these massive trillionaires have made sure that everything's going to be solid and good forever and you don't have to worry about anything it's not going to go down it's not going to cause some problems uh, we're going to keep you healthy just plug in forget about the so-called real world and just float in this other reality forever in other words goodbye permanently to everything you ever knew that was that you would consider to be real let's say you know your mother your friends your your world everything um, that's gone unless they show up in your in your electronic world um, I don't know it's hard for me to believe and maybe you, you do feel differently that most people would say go for it well I, I would absolutely opt for for reality um, mm -hmm. But I, I do in some ways feel unique uh, in that regard amongst my peers. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I just I, I have a sense of how tempting it is. And, and I my take on this reality we live in is that it, I don't know. This is just conjecture. It might not be reality at all. I, I actually feel like um, the Matrix is alive and well. And, and people often opt for, for an easier, um, you know, uh, whatever direction um, takes less responsibility. I, I don't know. I mean, th these are all just, um, yeah. yeah. I think you're right. I mean, that, that we, we do, people do, do those things. Um, how extreme they would go, I don't know. But, uh, and your, 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 your point about, is this reality that we're over, that we're in? What does it mean that it's reality that we're connected to? You know, it's a fascinating thing because obviously, on the level of physics and any, anything you go that's deeper than our superficial experience, um, in terms of what's really going on here, it's so incredibly different from what we seem to be um, dealing with, what we call reality. Um, that it, I mean, that's one of the most fascinating things about about life, that we have this thing which seems so palpably real on many, many levels. And yet it's completely different from the fundamental underlying reality that exists, you know. Um, and uh, but it's somehow congealed and cohered in a way with our nervous systems that we can live in and relate to this thing that we call reality and it works you know it functions as if reality it's not like there's black cats that that walk across <laughs> your field that like in the matrix and oops a glitch you know a glitch, yeah. um, it's it's pretty it's coherent and consistent and it and it, it it's uh it is what it is and now whether we should have some special allegiance to that that thing that we're living in is a really interesting question. I mm. mean, uh, the difference is, I think, that the reality, the, what we are living in right now is not something that some human being concocted or created for us. It is, whatever it is, it's this more organic, uh, emergent, unpredictable, um system that we are living in that is our life and is everyone else's life together as opposed to something like the matrix well the matrix was of course in the film it was created by advanced computers but one way or another that all falls back to humans at some level they created the they created the machines and the computers in the first place but but uh 
the idea of, yeah, that's sort of diving into a matrix. You're diving into something that was intentionally created as a fictional reality, intentionally, as opposed to, we could say that, well, we're living in kind of a fiction anyway here right now. It, it's just what we think is happening. Um, but in my view, nobody intentionally created that as a fiction. It just, it's the emergent reality. In my, bit, in my opinion, it, it is what has emerged from the universe, literally. That the universe, we can only trace it back 13.8 billion years. Nobody knows what happened at the very, so to speak, beginning. Science just steps back, says that's beyond our ability. So something happened. Something's been happening for 13.8 billion years. All the stars and the galaxies formed, planets formed, stuff happened. And then on Earth, we have this amazing, you know, uh, emergence of life and this amaz amazing emergence eventually of human beings who are the ones who can be talking about this, the only ones that we know about who can be talking about this question at all. Um, and so I look at it as this, you could say mysterious emergence, process of emergence that emerged from the stuff itself mm. without mm. someone saying, I'm gonna make this up for you <laughs> because, like they would be in the matrix. I've got a good story for you that I'm gonna, you can plug into and I'm gonna make sure it keeps unfolding in such and such a way for you. So that's, that's the difference. Now, why, is there any intrinsic reason why we should be, uh, have allegiance to the emergent reality, the thing that just organically happened as opposed to one that could be created intentionally for someone's enjoyment or someone's interest? That's a really interesting question, you know, and that comes down to that question of allegiance. What what are your deepest allegiances and why? And I don't I don't have an answer to why we must or should or why I must or should uh, pay top allegiance to the emergent reality that I'm living in right now, as opposed to, you know, the matrix or even even Luke, if we go far we take far fewer steps toward the matrix than that, just embracing all kinds of beliefs and structures of thought that so many people do that give them some sort of benefit, but that I can't see how they're actually grounded in reality or legitimate. You know, why, why do I have the allegiance to the thing that is right and what I think is right and true and legitimate as opposed to something that's fabricated? Um, that's the fundamental question that I play with in my book or that I explore. And I don't have a definitive question other than to say, <laughs> I suppose it comes down to this is the way I feel, mm. you know, I mean, cause I don't think you're ever going to find an absolute uh, reason. Yeah. I, I, I think I share the same feeling and um, I thought it was really, I mean, I thought, first of all, the cover of the book is just absolutely beautiful. I have it in front of me and um, here's what happened with the cover. I had a real boring cover originally. And then I made a slightly less boring one. It was all text, though. And then I happened to see that image that's on the cover. Uh, I don't know. Some Scientific American was showing really cool uh, images. And I went, wow, that one is amazing. So I contacted the guy who had made it with us with a laser scanning microscope uh, of the foot of a beetle. And uh, I said, hey, I really love this. Any chance I could use it for the cover of the book? And he said, sure. So. I created the cover that you see, and then I sent it to George Foster, who's an award-winning you know, book cover designer who lives here, because I wanted him just to weigh in. I was asking people this new text cover versus this new mm. graphical wild cover, <laughs> just to get their votes. I was really just asking, I wasn't asking George to do any work for me. I just said, how would you vote? And he said, oh, I like the, the colorful wild one. And then he just said, you know, I would uh, move this font down and uh, and put a little drop shadow on this and, and la la. That's basically what he said to me. So I was able to take all of his suggestions just to tweak it, make it just that much better. But so, uh, yeah, he helped. Well, kudos to you and, and shout out to George, I guess, but it's a beautiful yeah. cover. And um, I thought, 
you know, that little blurb you wrote in the beginning, if that doesn't just kind of like, in my mind, just define belief and, and kind of asking us, could it be this? Could it be that? How would you know? <laughs> um, I freaking love that. And I, I've often sensed that the power of belief is, is probably the strongest one. Would you agree with that? That it, it commands the most power? Um, yeah, I think it gets, it moves so many things in, in society. I mean, it has yeah. importance for individuals, obviously, what they believe or don't believe. It helps, often it helps direct certain aspects of their life or at least change the subjective state that they have in their lives, whether they're feeling on track or that they're going somewhere or whatever. But socially, so on the level of society, yeah, the power of belief has just been the big thing, whether you think of Christianity basically taking over the Western world, not just the Western world. I mean, it's huge and huge in South America and Africa, uh, other places. Um, belief driven social transformation, you know, just uh, and then to more horrific things like, uh, you know, the Nazis and their beliefs, uh, which it's not clear to me how many I just don't know how many German citizens fully embraced Hitler's beliefs, but certainly that country, that, that society was dedicated and was going along with these horrific beliefs, um, you know, on and on through the ages. So whether it's, and then right now in our society, we have this tremendous division that is kind of, is, you could say, belief driven. You know, if we just talk about the narrow focus on American politics and the division that we have now, you could talk about it in so many different ways, but one way, the one aspect you could highlight is, you know, there's a huge number of people in America who believe that the presidential election was stolen, was a complete fraud. Um, and, and then an equal or possibly greater number, I think a little bit greater number who believe not, not at all. It was completely fair. It's been tested. It's been reviewed by judges and panels and it's, com but you get no, uh, no uh, meeting of the minds there generally at all. I mean, that's just one example, as we know, in the political spectrum now, the, the, the uh, opposing beliefs that at the moment are causing some concern, you know, in terms of the, it's not just normal political divisiveness that we've got going on. It's that sort of stymies legislation and so forth. I mean, that's, we've kind of been aware of that for a long time, but it's getting much more heated than that. You know, you're, you've got, you've got threats of violence, you know, from various parties coming up now. In other words, your beliefs are so wrong <laughs> that we, we have to do whatever it takes, including violence, to get you out of here because our beliefs are the right ones and our beliefs are so important and, and you think your beliefs are so important that we've got to come to, come to blows or, or violence possibly to sort this out. And that's of course happened in the past, you know, civil war and so forth, um, all through society. You have two groups that believe completely different things and, uh, and it can lead to, you know, to violence. Yeah. I um I wanted to get your thoughts on um uh the general trend on on social media right now which is basically censorship um is a big big thing YouTube I mean if you just utter the words covid it's going to pop up with a little you know the algorithm already knows about that so uh you know they're talking about and I'm pretty sure they're already doing this I mean they're scanning our phones for text messages and and various you know, if someone's spreading misinformation, they want to know. And then, you know, we we were talking off camera just about some other podcasts and and things that that we enjoy. And and I, I think there is some serious concern that um, we're not having debates on really serious topics, ones as serious as like COVID, um, where it's like, yeah, do we know if iver ivermectin works or not? I don't even know. I we haven't really had a panel of scientists debate it. You know, that's disturbing. I don't I don't like that at all. Um, 
what what are your thoughts there? I mean, should social media be censoring us to some degree and and flagging misinformation? Sh- should a higher power be <laughs> doing that? It's really a really a big tough question, isn't it? I yeah. Mean, um, you know, you some people will say, "Oh yeah, social these 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 social media giants are just liberal bastions and they're just clamping down on other people's ways of seeing the world." That's one way, and to some extent, that that may be true. Although you certainly don't see f- Facebook wasn't doing any of that in the in the earlier days. It seems more that it's uh, it's uh, being fueled by the fear of of uh, government clampdown if they don't. You know, there's always saber rattling that unless social media starts getting starts refusing misinformation, so-called misinformation you know, that then the government's going to step in and do whatever they think they can do. So those are some of the motivations um, uh, as to why that, so to speak, censorship may be may be happening. But, you know, if you if you if you take a more liberal or libertarian view that people should be able to be exposed to anything and decide for themselves where they stand or how they react to it, which has a great appeal. And that kind of freedom and openness of all media has a great appeal. Um, What that assumes, well, probably any kind of libertarian view assumes that the people, the consumers of all this stuff, um, have the wherewithal to, to tell the difference between something that is legitimate, trustworthy, or not. Now, that doesn't mean are they stupid or are they smart? I mean, obviously, the people vary on that spectrum as well. But it's also how much time or even interest, but even just let's just talk time, does the average person, the average busy person who maybe is a single mother or, or whatever and has kids and is trying to homeschool them during COVID and and uh, has a job and <laughs> how much time yeah. do they have to try to verify anything? Just like you said, Luke, you know, you don't even know, I don't know what the bottom line is going to be or even is today about ivermectin or other things. Is there even a bottom line? How do you find it? Huge amount of research would be required. And so what people do instead well, some people will, will gravitate towards those who they think should actually have the expertise. Let well, maybe say the Weinsteins or somebody, you know, people who have a good scientific background, um, are extremely smart, spend a lot of time, you know, uh, investigating things. You go, well, okay, I'm going to lean towards some experts. Other people will lean towards someone like Dr. Fauci. And of course, you'll have this massive conflict between people saying, He's bogus. He's just he's sold out or something. And then on the other side saying these guys have just bought into, you know, one colored pill or the other and are believing all of all of this conspiracy stuff. And so you have this this conflict. So um, people kind of pick and choose who they're going to believe. Um, And then they go with it because they don't have the wherewithal a lot of people to and it's not even clear how you would if you even had the wherewithal to to figure out all this stuff for yourself. Now that's one thing in the cases of where you have experts on both sides. But as you know, in the like 2016 election and other elections, it seems to be the case that Russian Russian bots and agents did all kinds of stuff on social media just to try to mess up, mess with the minds of some of the voters in a way that they thought would be advantageous to their own country. And if you're really good at this, as the Russians and Chinese and others are increasingly getting, you can put into social media things that sound good and powerful to certain groups of people, but have absolutely no basis necessarily in fact at all. They're not even putting forth, you know, really credentialed experts. They're just putting out incendiary things that people also get attracted to. So it's an unbelievably difficult problem. and again, as I said, if you could trust everybody to, to walk through that forest of craziness on all sides and come out with something 
that is defensible and realistic and 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 worth worth uh, accepting, then we wouldn't have a problem. No one, no one should be talking about any kind of, so to speak, censorship or interference. But we don't have that. And so now we have these halting attempts to kind of interfere with the flow of the free flow of information. Yeah. But what do you think? I mean, how, uh, how could this be done? That's a really <laughs> good, good question. I don't know. Um, but uh, as far as listening to podcasts, I, I do a lot of that. Um, I really, really appreciate getting two sides of an argument. Um, I went down a rabbit hole of, of listening to Christopher Hitchens uh, in all of his God debates. I loved that. Um, so I, I just consumed everything that for a really long time. And Sam Harris does some too, which are, are really entertaining. Um, but I, I really benefit from from diving into it from both angles a lot and find myself in many ways playing devil's advocate that I, I feel very comfortable in that space. But as at, like, you know, I'm a creator on YouTube and I, I don't want to feel like something's out of bounds necessarily, or that, you know, for a lot of people who have more prominent channels, they're getting demonetized. And in some cases their very livelihood and, and, you know, ways of earning money and all this stuff just get completely yanked um, in, many cases it's a, a a robot or an algorithm that's doing that a human being has done nothing to um, actually listen to the content and kind of place it in the greater context of things so that i don't know to me that's like extremely disturbing um i i find myself getting very little enjoyment out of facebook right now it used to be a way to kind of connect with friends kind of see from a distance what they're doing say like out of state and now it's just just extreme bashing of people's opinions and, and beliefs. Um, so I've kind of taken a backseat to social media. If I'm not doing something like we're doing today, then I, I won't get on and I won't share something. Um, because, yeah, it, it's getting ugly. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, if, if, mo if most people were like you in the sense of you have a lively interest in and hearing both sides, exploring it in a in an open way, and obviously we all make our, our choices in the end, you know, and that's how it should be. Um, and you know, I would have no fear of you being exposed to anything, you know, on YouTube or the or social media. Um, uh, people with that kind of an approach, you know, you may end up with with different uh, decisions than I would. But that's all right, you know. I mean, as as long as we have a a fair, uh, open, you know, evidence based, in, in my opinion, uh, evidence based approach to some of these controversies. But as I said, the problem is, and I think this is why we're getting this this difficult um, quasi censorship going on, is that. Um, most people aren't like you. Either they don't have the time, or the interest, or the inclination, or the or the um, yeah the orientation to pursue these these difficult questions and actually be interested interested in the pursuit mm. even. Um, and so you have people who are easily, and that's been that's been shown to be the case. You know, in those Facebook uh, 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 attacks, so to speak, that happened in the earlier elections. You know, it's been shown in media that people, you put out some really incendiary thing that maybe is baseless, but it's just put out in just the right way to the right groups. And it just goes wild. You get tremendous numbers of likes and shares and people glom over to these groups. So people are ready to do kind of a, of a hair trigger response to something that just moves them in some way mm. and 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 that's the problem if people are going to be jacked around that that easily that has major repercussions for society uh for our elections for everything yeah and and that's the tough problem but as and as i was saying unlike you most people i don't think exhibit even an interest in sorting through things they'd much rather just react to whatever comes their way and go either yes no 
and then go that way a little bit more if it's a yes or stay away if it's a no. And they gradually move into, you know, a camp, so to speak, in, in that area. And uh, and that's <laughs> that's what's going on, which is sort of the opposite of an investigative open you know exploration of reality that's just a reactive uh a reactive response to stimulus yeah (laughs) a lot of times the stimulus is engineered yeah that's the problem engineered to move (laughs) you one way or another well that and it works yeah so we were talking about you know how do you package and and sell tm but i wanted to come back to the the cover of your book which You know, someone could look at it, and I think you alluded to this uh, about it, but someone could look at it and say, wow, it's just so beautiful. Like, I believe in that. Or, um, (laughs) you know, like, I, before we read the little excerpt, my mom and I were like, what the hell is that? Well, it's amazing. I love it. You know, we had no idea that it was, what, the foot of a beetle or something. But, you know, getting back to that, um, you know, belief is powerful and, and, to go a step further, like the people who control it. I mean, like, say even like rigorous scientific research of something, profound research collected in the best way, like the purest data, and it's just irrefutable. Well, then you're still like telling the story. You come back to the the village and you're like, hey, like we did this. It was incredible. It was also on Pluto. Like, you know, and it turns out there's sunflowers over there. You know, like... Oh, fuck. Or, uh, I just dropped an F-bomb on the, we maybe censor that, but you know, like, like human beings are so fallible. Like how, I mean, does, does any of this give you hope? I mean, did you write the book and it, I don't know, did it, did it alleviate <laughs> some depression or, or, uh, induce it? Well, none of this depresses me to tell you the truth. I mean, I have the concerns that we've been talking about, but it doesn't depress me. I'm, I mean, <laughs> maybe I should be, but I'm not, you know, I mean, I certainly have friends who are for a lot of reasons, you know, not just personal, but about everything that's going on. But uh, I, I just feel good about the approach that everybody probably feels good about their own, but I feel good about the approach that I have um, to explore uh, what, what's real and what's true and what isn't. And I love uh, the, the sense of legitimacy and, and, and strength that comes from accumulated consensus of really good investigation into the world. So your thing about, you know, uh, sunflowers on Pluto or whatever. Yeah, if some one scientist says, you know, hey, they're there. That's interesting, but that's not good enough. Uh, an example I mentioned in the book is, you know, in the 80s, there were two scientists in Utah who who wrote a paper that that claimed and had it published in a real a real journal, claimed that they had produced cold fusion in their laboratory, which would be the holy grail of energy production. You know, it, has, it produces no radioactive, no radioactive byproducts, much more energy you know, super cheap, blah, blah, um, would be the, the solution to all of our energy problems. Uh, they, they got it. They did the research. They got it peer reviewed. It was published. It had massive publicity, you know, in the media. And then nobody could reproduce it. And so it went down the drain. And that's what happens in science. So if, if one guy says there's, you know, there's sunflowers on Pluto, and then the next three guys, assuming they could actually all go there and check it out with some space craft and go, no way, man, that must have been some dirt on your lens or whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just not happening. It goes down the tubes. And that's how science works. It doesn't always happen super quickly, but these days it tends to happen pretty quickly. Mm. Because people, if it's, if it's really interesting and really uh, important, people jump in. They either want to prove or disprove, or they want to take it one step further. Usually that's what they want to do. They want to take it a step further, but to take it a step further, they have to sort of replicate the reality in the first place. Is this really going on? And if it's not, it just goes down. It's just gone. And that's the thing about science. You know? Well, how, how would you compare that against like, say, global warming? Um, 
there's all kinds of probably definitive research. I haven't actually looked at the research, but it's there, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Incredibly valid. Yeah. Uh, those sunflowers on Pluto do exist. And yet there is still this divide, right? Right. right. So. Well, yes, there is. And just to give a two minute thing about climate change, because I'm pretty uh, involved in that work. Um, yeah, the scientific consensus is is extremely strong. Uh, just uh, in the last couple of weeks, this group called the IPCC, which is a UN body, like over 200 experts from all over the world worked on this report. They, they sifted through something like 16,000 studies and they came came out with a consensus view that was far stronger. And they said that the science is far stronger than it was on their last report, you know, X number of years ago. It's getting stronger and stronger and stronger, the consensus about what's the direction that we're headed and how serious it is. Um, so the scientific consensus is among the strongest we've had. Um, but uh, there are scientists, and it's not like that means that 100% of scientists all agree. It's not just that there are people out there who don't, don't, don't believe it. There are also scientists who will disagree. They're in the very strong minority, and that's the case with science. You know, um, any, any branch of science, you will always have some credentialed scientists who disagree with the consensus. Now, some of those people who disagree with the consensus will eventually be proven right, and they'll change the consensus, although that's difficult to do, obviously, if you get a really, really strong consensus based on lots of good research. But uh, so that's one thing uh, that some scientists will disagree with. And then there's people who disagree that climate change is really a serious thing for a whole bunch of reasons. In my view, a lot of the reason is they may be uh, dedicated Republicans and many, many Republican prominent leaders have been climate deniers or so to speak, and they pick up their views from the party rather than investigating anything themselves. Um, or they watch Tucker Carlson or whatever, and they get their views and they just accept them because these are real powerful dudes and, uh, and they, they like what they say. And so you end up with, with that. But, but the consensus moves on. You know, Look back on smoking. Uh, there was certainly a time where lots of doctors uh, supposedly recommended smoking and get, were in ads. And, and then uh, as the scientists started to show that there were problems, you had a huge pushback from the tobacco industry and trying, as we have from the oil and gas industry in past years, trying to disprove climate change. We, have, we had that from the, uh, from the tobacco industry, massive uh, pushback. And people were confused. People go, hey, it's not, it's not established. They keep smoking. But the science moved on and got stronger and stronger. And then eventually you get to the point where at least for large numbers of people, smoking is out. Yeah. And uh, everybody pretty much accepts the science and they go, they may smoke anyway. They go, whatever, I don't think it's gonna happen <laughs> to me or I don't care or whatever. But science has that way uh, of moving on to something, a really strong consensus that appears to be the case. And often society eventually catches up like they did with smoking to a large degree. And hopefully we'll get there soon with climate because we don't have much time. Yeah. Smoking is one thing. It affects those who smoke. doesn't affect so much those who don't smoke. But climate affects that will eventually affect everybody and um, whether you believe it or not. And uh, so it's it, we don't have much time left. And so hopefully... But this is a big problem. It's not coming fast enough. The, the, the scientific consensus is coming fast and has come fast and strong, but it's not, it's not getting through to enough people, even though the majority of people in the US accept the idea that cl the climate's changing and that it's got dangers and that humans are causing. It. But that doesn't, it hasn't taken them far enough to say, We've got to do something about this now. That threshold has not been crossed. And I don't know if it's going to be or, or how it's going to be or how, what more can be done. I mean, people are thinking about that all the time. What more can be done to take what is a scientific consensus and not just 
get people to believe, okay, yeah, that's probably true. But beyond that to say, come on government, because at this, at this point, the problem is so huge that it does take the government. You know, individuals can't fix climate change on their own uh, by changing their lifestyle. It has to be done at a, at a massive uh, organizational level, just changing the way the economy uh, works and what's incentivized and so forth. Um, will that happen in time? I don't know. I, I think <clears throat> you talk about miracles in your book. I feel like it would take a miracle uh, in, in the sense and um, that it would, it would have to disrupt people's beliefs. Like, you know, it, it, you know, California would have to like go into the ocean or something, or um, yeah. aliens have to touch down or something, right? Something like that, because otherwise people are just going to keep Netflixing, Netflixing and chilling. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting when we look at history, there have been ta- the the big example that's always used is World War II, where we were just, you know, hanging along, staying out of it. And then, you know, after Pearl Harbor, we jump in with both feet and and Roosevelt and the government say, I'm go- we're going to transform our economy overnight. They said, all of you car manufacturers, no more. You are creating tanks or you're creating jet planes um, and all you other manufacturers who have the capability, you're not doing what you're doing before. You're going to build bombs and guns and ammunition. And um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. We also, you know, did all kinds of rationing and just transformed the economy literally overnight. Not to mention we built the H bomb, the, the atomic bomb in a, in a few years whatever one thinks about that, it was done. And uh, so there was no miracle there. I mean, there was some huge event, which was Pearl Harbor, and people go, you can't do this to us, you know? <laughs> so it doesn't yeah, maybe, have to be a, mir- yeah, a miracle. Yeah, miracle was the wrong word, I think. Yeah. That's something of order of mag- magnitude. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It has to be, well, it has to be a threat that you internalize or, or something that makes you extremely angry. Um, so Pearl, Pearl Harbor, I think, made us extremely angry at the Japanese. And, and then we got, of course, we got in with Hitler just because he was part of that, that alliance. Um, Hitler didn't, wasn't part of Pearl Harbor, but, you know, we were at war with both of them and we were all gung, gung-ho. But, um, you know, we we're extremely angry. It really is that, you know, you can't do this. To, oh, look at 9-11. Ex- well, we were scared. Uh, the, the country got scared by that, but they also got extremely angry. You can't do that to the United States. We're going to come and hunt you down. And then it did all kinds of crazy stuff with Iraq and so forth. But but that kind of mo- thing motivates the American people. Um, if we go back to uh, the Civil War, you know, there were, okay, there was an attack on Fort Sumter and things. Okay, there were individual things that maybe people said that's, we can't accept that. But fundamentally, there was this totally just different approach to what what's right, you know, what, what you should be able to do or not do um, as far as slavery and so forth. And uh, so that's a little different. It wasn't like we came, we came up north and just started, you know, killing you all, you know. It wasn't an attack on us that made us feel scared. It was a moral, to a certain extent, a large extent, it was a moral um, transformation saying, okay, we're willing to lose some hundreds of thousands of, of our boys to for what's essentially a moral cause, that is to save the union and to, to stop the slavery. Um, so that's interesting because that's a more of a moral or or uh, your allegiance, what do you think is, what do you value? And your values were enough to make you rise up and do something extremely hard. Mm. Um, now that's sort of more how climate change is kind of in the middle there because, or both, because it's, it's values. It's like, hey, humanity in general, including us in the United States are gonna get whacked more and more and more in more terrible ways if we don't Put the brakes on and, and reverse this. So it's like that's not good. Um, that that violates our values. That humanity shouldn't be heading towards suffering. 
On the other hand, it's also, it's kind of like an attack, but it's not an attack by an enemy. It's not like, oh, those Japanese or, you know, or those uh, Osama bin Laden. There's no singular force that we can get mad at and fight. So that's lacking in the case of climate change. It comes down more to the values-based thing. And it could be a fear-based thing too. But what it's lacking is the anger-based thing. Now, some people try to instill an anger-based thing like, oh, the oil companies have been you know, deluding us and giving us bad information. They knew this was going to be happening. So they try to turn it into an anger-based thing, but that hasn't caught, caught on at this point. So the question is whether our human values will be enough to get us out of chilling, chilling with Netflix and the business of our daily lives, because we're relatively comfortable, most of us, you know? It's not like, it's not, of course, people were relatively comfortable at Pearl Harbor too. It's not like Americans were having a bad time at home, but this right. one thing they go, no, we are going to stop this and we'll, we'll pay a big price to stop it. Um, but so I don't know, I don't know what's going to, nobody knows what's going to happen, but, uh, the science is on, is on the side, you know, but uh, it's all a matter of marketing, if you want to use that strange word. Yeah, the way you package things, you know, yeah. to make them more attractive to people. Um, yeah, to move them. Yeah. It's all about moving them, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious how, how your book relates to, to you as a parent. Like, I remember growing up... <clears throat> um, you know, like my mom was certain she was not going to kind of tell me about Santa. Like the second I could ask the question, she was going to, you know, make it known what that actually was. And, um, you know, I'm 32, soon to be 33. And, and you know, kids are more of the conversation. And, and um, my girlfriend has a son uh, six years old. So, you know, I'm getting all kinds of exposure into like, okay, what are we going to, you know, how are we going to craft belief, uh, you know, about the tooth fairy and all these other things. And um, I'm just curious what your thoughts were about that as a, as well, a parent. Well, it's interesting. Yourself. I don't know if you got that far, but I have a, a short chapter on uh, a short section on, on Santa Claus. You, you did. Um, and I, I stumbled over that page just yeah, flipping yeah, through the rest of the book. Yeah. yeah I like that. Yeah, so, I mean, it's really interesting. I thought uh, that that the Western world, at least, or large parts of the world, unlike your mom, go out of their way to instill and preserve a belief in this this guy, Santa Claus, that's completely outrageous. <laughs> I mean, it's fun and it's yeah. it, it serves lots of cool purposes as a story, but it's not like a story. It's not like you're reading them a fairy tale and. Oh, yeah, uh -huh. Hansel and Gretel, whatever, dragon stuff, you know, because the kids know that's not really true. But this isn't like that. This is like really true. <laughs> this is the way it works at Christmas. This is going on. And you, and we instill it and we want to instill it, most of us. And um, yeah, and in, in my life, uh, when my daughter was young, you know, um, five, whatever age, um, I remember our house on on second street you've been there uh that old house and uh yeah and uh you know one christmas we set up some elaborate thing where we had a tape recorder you know saying ho 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 or whatever <laughs> and you know, annie was upstairs and doorbell rings and something goes ho ho you know <laughs> and we go to these lengths to make it to sort of fool her or to not to fool her because she probably already she believed in santa claus but to make it seem that much more evidence-based you're real so we go to this this extent knowing that it will go away at some point which it does whether early or late we admit either a friend tells them or the parent eventually gives in and tells them or something happens or the kid just goes this is bogus you know this can't be true for this and this reason and it goes away um and so that easily goes away and is replaced by reality. The kid wants reality. He likes Santa Claus. He liked that was fun, that was cool, but he wants reality more. Otherwise, why would he even ask the question or, you know, there's some degree of, is this real? Mm. 
Um, so there's that, that deep desire to be connected with reality rather than really rewarding cool stories about reality. Um, so the kid goes through that. Um, we instill it, he rejects it. But as I said in the book, that doesn't translate into the adults later similarly being dedicated to reality and rejecting other things that are that are attractive stories that have no evidence behind them, but they like them because of that the, they're rewarding for them. They do something that they like. They, they enrich their life in some way, just as the kid's life was sort of enriched by Santa Claus and all that in the early days. So they maintain the pattern, even though they went through this, you know, Tooth Fairy is not real, Santa Claus is not real, Easter Bunny is not real. You know, all these things are not real. <laughs> they go, okay, there's reality and there's stories. But then they graduate to more stories and those stories for many, for probably the majority of people last forever. There's no way to dislodge them. And yeah, people like Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and just in that sphere and many other people in other spheres do their best to try to dislodge these things. And they do dislodge them from some people. But most people either don't get exposed to that or they're just not interested. They prefer their stories. Yeah. And so they, they keep them. But, you know, like I said, with our daughter, we didn't. That was probably before I became more and more you know, committed <laughs> in my complete skepticism. Um, so I certainly went along with that typical American game. Sure. Um, I, I'm curious if I don't know. Are, are you an atheist? Yeah, I mean, that word atheist has a lot of uh, baggage in people's minds. Some people look at it as an extremely negative thing, almost like it's a devilish thing. You know, I mean, there's plenty of people who feel that. It has that baggage of you rejecting the most important thing in the universe, and it's horrible and it's bad. Um, that's the only reason I wouldn't flaunt that label, mm. just because it has this weird side effects. Um, you could say I'm an agnostic in the sense that I don't know, but Richard Dawkins addressed this, you know, he said, on a scale of one to 10, where, where uh, 10 is a total atheist, absolutely co complete, no possibility of room for belief in God, you know, and one is total belief in God. He wouldn't make himself a 10, even though he wrote a whole book about the God division. <laughs> but I think he gave himself a nine point something. <laughs> <laughs> because there's just as a scientist right yeah you have to. to hold out that and i'm the same way yeah um you know i have done to totally change the subject from atheism for a second sure. and think of talk about aliens which you mentioned before yeah let's talk about aliens yeah um, <laughs> many years ago maybe 15 years ago a friend of mine who is much more uh open than i am to believing things claims that he encounters for whatever reason, was pretty was convinced that aliens either were already here or would very shortly be absolutely revealed to be to be here. And uh, so we made we made a bet. And back then, <laughs> he didn't ask his wife about this because later his wife refused to allow him to bet me about things like this. <laughs> we made a five hundred dollar bet and I gave him 10 years. I said, Here's the criteria. Within 10 years, and this was back when we had three major networks, TV, you know, this was a long time ago. I said, within 10 years, all three major networks will, dis will present as factual that aliens are here and are making, are making contact, not as some people say or, you know, blah, blah type of story, but as fact. And I said, with the same factuality as they represented that the World Trade Centers went down. I mean, in other words, this is a fact. We're just talking about facts here. And I said, if they do that, you win $500. If they don't, <laughs> I do. And of course, you know who won. But, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm still in that boat. I, in fact, you know, I made a $10 bet with him about a similar thing last year. Um, <laughs> Because he doesn't have to clear a $10 bet with his wife. But uh, so, you know, 
um, that's where I stand on a lot of these things. It's yeah. like, evidence, show me the evidence. But I'm not saying it is absolutely impossible. There are no aliens. I know it. And there will never be or there aren't yet. I don't know that at all. I'm intrigued by some of this stuff, you know, these weird radar thing, uh, videos, you know, of some strange object on a radar screen on a fighter jet um, and other th uh, the, the relatively small number of things that have not been, didn't have decent explanations. It's totally intriguing. Or um, I, I don't know if I mentioned this in the book, but uh, uh, a guy that I work with described these really bizarre experiences that he had. Um, and he's pretty much of a rationalist. It's not like he's out there. Um, you know, he talked about he was having dinner with his extended family and he, he put this plate towards a serving bowl because he was going to get some and the plate moved back to him. And then he put it there and it moved back to him. And then he eventually got some food on it and, and was at his plate. And then it started spinning slowly in front of him. And he claims that his wife saw some of that. And he's going, it happened. And I go, I have no idea what this is. Mm. There's no way to replicate it. It's a one-time thing. There's no uh, objective evidence about it at all. You've got subjective report. It may have been some strange psychological state that he and his wife somehow are in. That seems weird. Or someone may have been playing some sophisticated trick on him. That seems a little weird. It may have been poltergeist. That definitely seems weird. Um, but my conclusion is I don't know. Yeah. I don't know about aliens. I don't know about aliens. It does not seem likely to me for a whole bunch of reasons that they're here. Um, I don't know about poltergeists, but I'm inclined not to think that they're real. But I don't know. Yeah. And the mystery of it, too, is is much of the intrigue. The mystery of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's Yeah. Um, and I think it has to stay there. For me, it stays there. Certain things stay in that area mm. of this is a mystery. It would be nice if we could explore it more, but we can't in this particular case. <laughs> it happened once and now it's gone. With aliens, we can. We can continue to try to see what evidence there is or there isn't. But um, yeah, so as far as atheism, I definitely hold out. I'd be, I'd love it. There's plenty of things I would love. It's not like I go, I've got my little box I'm in and I feel really secure. I don't believe in anything and that's really good and I can protect that space. No, I'd love to be blown away. I'd love to have a, <laughs> a, a flying saucer hover over my house. And I'd love to um, have something that, have a plate spin in front of me. I'd love to have, I don't know what it would be with God, what he'd have to do. Um, it'd have to be pretty pretty uh strong to I, again i resonate <laughs> with everything you're saying I, I think i share those sentiments but um sam harris was talking about atheism in the sense that um you know like i, I think he gave the example of if i kiss my daughter's good night um and you know tomorrow might not come you know i i embrace these moments so much more um, without them being propped up by some sort of afterlife that it, it almost takes away from, you know, from this, uh, finite experience, human experience, which I thought was extremely profound. Like if you, if you strip away the story, you know, then these moments are absolutely precious. Right. Yeah. That's really, really true. And, uh, to me, it's bizarre that the promise of an afterlife, especially heaven, um, you know, you can talk about the reincarnation path or you can talk about the heaven path. That's sort of a one way ticket to heaven. And that's the end of it. And most Christians and and uh, and uh, Muslims and so forth. But um, it's this bizarre thing that we have no idea what it really would be like or whether we really would like it. By definition, it's supposed to be the greatest thing in the world to be in heaven. But we have no inkling of what that could possibly be to be in some eternal state, you know, of something or other, adoring God or whatever, forever with no change. And you know, our life has all been about change and growth and struggle and overcoming and, and just the diversity and richness of our life. 
And that pretty much, at least in the conventional sense, would be absent never the, in a heaven. But nevertheless, yeah, it's been this thing that somehow justifies and, 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 and enriches uh, people's lives um, for millennia. And that's just completely bizarre as opposed to now that may be in part because people's lives often in, in history were not as comfortable and as, as ours are. So we have the ability, you know, Sam Harris has a comfortable life and he's kissing his daughter goodnight and a lot of things in his life are very good. And um, that makes the richness of the moment all that more wonderful than if you're literally suffering or starving or, you know, what, or sick or whatever. So I can see why through history, a lot of people look to something else to, mm. uh, to redeem what, what's essentially a very difficult situation down here. And that's still true for obviously lots and lots of people that it's difficult and it would be nice for them. It would be nice. It is nice for them to believe that there's something better coming. Mm. Um, but you're right. I think that for people who are not in that situation or even people who are in the midst of great challenges or even suffering, but still can appreciate the richness of the moment as it is. And and the possibilities there and the fact that they're conscious and aware and they're part of it and they're they're also involved in creating the next moments you know for those that have the wherewithal to to be there to be present to that it's certainly something far more attractive to me than some far off reward um that will somehow redeem all of this you know it's funny because for a lot of people, I think through history, this life is just this weird preparatory ground. It's not the real thing at all. And uh, you just got to get through it and follow the rules and hope you get through it in a good way so that you can go to the good place um, afterwards. So in that sense, it was a devaluing of, of our lives here because they're merely a staging ground for, for the reality coming later. And if you don't have that, then yeah, you've got this the the opportunity to, to to connect with the richness that is here is is all the more uh, all the more important mm. what was the biggest challenge in writing the book um well i suppose it was deciding how to frame it um i have one guy who reviewed it who ended up by saying, it seemed like it was a bit of a, an apology for my skepticism rather than a uncompromising assertion of it. It was just sort of a abstract way of saying, yeah, I wasn't asserting my skepticism or let's say asserting athe atheism or something like Christopher Hitchens would or, or Harris did or uh, Dawkins and other people did. There's no bones about it, you know. Hitchens' book was "God is not great." How, <laughs> how religion poisons everything. You know? Yeah, you know? yeah that's just what he's going to just wail on it. Yeah, and that was absolutely not what I wanted to do. So instead, I tried to give, to whatever extent I could, um, legitimately, to present the other side, so to speak, or the believing point of view through history and today in a way that was you could see the some of the attractiveness of it um, and the values that people get out of it and still weave my way through that to say that's all fine and good I recognize that people get uh, report that they get stuff out of it or actually do get stuff out of their beliefs that may be quite important in their lives nevertheless I can't go there. I just can't because it doesn't seem real to me. And, and I've got that comes back to our beginning of our conversation, you know, allegiance to something that is real mm. as opposed to something that, that might produce fruits. Who cares if it's real? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, so threading that needle of uh, not wanting to be dismissive or judgmental, and yet I have to make some judgments. So it was, it was it was a complex thing. I mean, it was it was fun. It was it was an interesting challenge. But yeah, that was probably the hardest thing. And I think it worked, even though there will be people like that reviewer that I mentioned who said 
you know, you don't seem to be giving me a full throated, uncompromising, you know, view of skepticism. Yeah, that's not really what I was exactly trying to do. Um, it does seem that the, the readers that I've gotten responses from so far resonate with it in various aspects of their lives, you know, whether they're big, whether they're involved with TM or, or not, or whether they have that kind of a history or not, everybody's got questions of belief and reality and evidence and truth in their lives. And they're, they're having to sort all that out. And uh, every day, you know, if, if you're, if you're awake to what's going on, it's kind of like every day that yeah. you've got to <laughs> make some some uh, some choices about what seems right and what what seems real and what doesn't. And so, well, I, I think you skillfully and and artfully did exactly that and just kind of like honestly share the landscape of of belief and um, and approached it very scientifically. I, I really appreciate that and. I can't wait to finish the book. Um, <laughs> I know there's a lot more that I haven't gotten to yet with it, yeah. but uh, where do people, um, how do people acquire this book? Well, it's on Amazon. So the okay. easiest, there's two ways to see it on Amazon. One is to type tempted to believe. Do you have the book there? You want to show the cover? I do. Just, yeah, absolutely. And we can even okay. bring that in later too, in okay. the editing of it. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful book. I'm so glad you wrote it. Thanks. And I'm incredible. So, yeah, yeah. They could type tempted to believe, which is the main title in Amazon. It'll come right up. Or they could just type my last name, which is harder because they have to know how to spell it. And then it'll come right up. Um, but there's two versions out there just because I put out an early version because I wanted to get it in the hands of just a few people to get some early response. And that way I could get a physical book. So that's up there. And unfortunately with Amazon, once someone has purchased any version, it stays there forever. <laughs> I'd love to take it down because it's just slightly confusing, but it's not yeah. available anyway. So the colorful one, the one you just showed, the one that's available is the one. So yeah, it's just on Amazon, right? Terrific. Yeah. Do you think uh, down the road there there might be some more books? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how this one goes. I'm just at the beginning of trying to get the word out. Um, we'll see how much time I have for that. It's a big, big process and how lucky I am about certain avenues. And if it, uh, if it takes off more, then I'd be more, more motivated to do more. Um, I hope all. it, I hope it catches on like wildfire, man. I hope yeah. it spreads. And uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm really grateful that you, you did write the book and, um, uh, and it's something I'm going to cherish. So. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much, Luke. Yeah. Thanks so much for being on the show, Tom. And, um, huh. Yeah, I hope to talk again soon. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much, Tom. That's the end of it, but uh, unofficially, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>